Hello everyone, welcome to another Commander deck tech. Today I'm excited to share with you a Commander deck for a test card that I was surprised to totally fall in love with the idea of playing. There are a bunch of these test cards that came out with Mystery Booster 2, and a lot of them have really interesting ideas attached to them that fit right up the alley of what I'd like to build. So please let me know if there are any favorites that you have in there, and I would love to make a deck tech for any of them. Let's dive into this deck tech for Wowzer the Aspirational. Wowzer has a lot going on, but there are really two areas that you need to pay attention to, and that's the mana cost and the requirements for winning the game on his attack trigger. So let's go through that. Wowzer costs a colorless, Wooberg, and a snow, which if you're unfamiliar is just any mana produced by a snow land. It reads, whenever Wowzer attacks, if you have an energy, control a blood, a clue, a food, a map, a power stone, and a treasure, are the monarch, and have the city's blessing, and the initiative, you win the game. That is a lot of requirements. You would think that with this kind of deck, the problem you're going to run into is consistency, and that is exactly what we're fighting against today. There are, essentially, 14 requirements you need to meet before you can win the game with this commander. The 10 specific things it asks for, the ability to attack, a colorless mana production, mana production of every color, and snow mana production. What I'm trying to do here is make the deck as consistent as possible. And one of the biggest boons that I have found when researching this deck is that 13 out of the 14 requirements can be fulfilled by lands. So this deck is playing 42 lands and each one is fulfilling a specific requirement or getting us closer to fulfilling one of them. Then this deck is playing 24 cards that I would classify as ramp or just additional ways to get us lands onto the battlefield or fetch from our deck. The remaining cards are card advantage such as tutors, protection, haste enablers, and other cards that will help us more consistently get all of the requirements met such that Wowzer can enter the battlefield and attack and win on the same turn. So let's go through all of these one by one. Let's talk about our ramp cards first. The general idea is that if we have enough of these ramp cards that we are able to find us the lands that we need, we will have the versatility to be able to find every requirement in the deck. It's a lot of work, but like Wowzer, we have a dream that we need to fulfill. I'm going to start with Courser of Crewfix, which is actually kind of a bad example of ramp, but it does give us a peek at the top of the deck and lets us grab some lands there. Looking at the top of the deck is helpful for a number of reasons, and I'm going to go into those reasons a little bit later. Court of Bounty gives us the Monarch, which is one of our requirements, and lets us play lands from our hand every turn regardless of if we are the Monarch or not. Crop Rotation and Elvish Reclaimer let us swap out a land for something else that fits a requirement. This is handy because we have a lot of redundancy in the deck. The ability to swap out these tools for other tools is nice to have. Then we have some generic land searching engines with Expedition Map, Hour of Promise, Nylea's Intervention, Tempt with Discovery, and Reshape the Earth, most of them allowing you to search for multiple lands of any type. Reshape the Earth will get you enough lands to win the game, so this can be used as kind of an alternate win con. Explore the Underdark only searches for basic lands, which will help us with the snow requirement and in getting additional colors, but it also helps us get the initiative, which we'll talk about each of those requirements more in depth later. Into the North we'll search for a snow land, and in this deck we're playing a lot of snow lands. Again, we'll talk about the snow aspect a bit later. Raska Relic and Wayward Swordtooth both have Ascend, another thing we'll talk about later, but they're also pretty good at ramp, so that's good to mention here. And then we have the World Tree, which doesn't ramp us, but it does perfectly fix our mana, so we don't have to worry about having the right colors for Wowzer. Now, let's talk about a subsection of the ramp package, which is South Mill. Some of the cards that are best at making multiple types of artifact tokens also happen to care about self mill, and since a lot of our lands could potentially end up in the graveyard, I figure that one easy way to leverage the graveyard and get some card advantage is to lean into the self mill and get effects that get land back from our graveyard. 
Blossoming Tortoise is really cool because it mills and returns lands repeatedly, and it also makes it easier to activate abilities of lands such as the ones you'll see later that generate the requirements that we need. Lumrabello of the Woods, Nyx Weaver, and World Shaper all similarly mill and return cards, but they do so in a much more limited fashion than Blossoming Tortoise, so I think it's an all-star in this deck. Another all-star is the Necro Bloom. It's a great card for giving our lands dredge two in the graveyard, meaning that we can choose to mill to return them instead of drawing a card. This is a great way to generate card advantage because it fills up our graveyard more, and it can flexibly grab the lands that we need. Court of Ardenvel gives us the Monarch, and it lets us return permanence with mana value 3 or less from the graveyard. It doesn't specifically mill, but if any of the lands that we want do end up in there and we don't have a way to get them back, this can grab us a couple of the essential pieces. Deadbridge Chant gives us a whole bunch of mill right at the start, and then it gives us a random card every turn, which that part is an idea, but the mill is just a whole bunch of card advantage for us. Hedron Crab is great because it continuously mills us for playing lands. We just have a lot of lands and a lot of ways of getting lands, so we can pretty consistently trigger those. And finally, Soul of Wind Grace lets us return lands repeatedly, but it also lets us get some draw or life gain if we need it in a pinch. If we discard lands and then return them with his ability, that's a powerful synergy and can allow us to play multiple lands per turn. Okay, moving away from our lands for a bit, let's talk a bit more about our card advantage engines. These are mostly just easy ways for us to get a few extra cards or tutor it for the exact card we need. Beseech the Queen can flexibly let us find a card that is cheaper than the number of lands we control. We are probably not going to be able to cast this for black, 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 but it doesn't really matter when we cast it because most likely we're looking for a land. Inventor's Fair is really handy because a bunch of our requirements are also fulfilled by artifacts, and so the ability to fetch any artifact is super handy. We'll talk a little bit more about why this is important later. Retreat to Coral Helm is mostly just a nice landfall ability. The untapping and tapping creatures isn't super relevant in the deck, but the scrying ability is pretty helpful for digging through our deck. Royal Cartographer will give us energy counters when landfall happens. Then, if we have a whole bunch of those, we can pay six of them to draw three cards. So that's a nice payoff for having a bunch of energy effects, and it adds another way to draw cards. And I think this card is a perfect encapsulation of the idea that we want cards that both give us one of the requirements and fulfill some other purpose in the deck, like card draw. Thought Vessel is handy because we could very likely draw a whole bunch of cards all at once. Trading Post is an interesting card that mostly just serves one purpose, and that's just to get artifacts out of the graveyard if they end up there. So it's important for a couple of the synergies in this deck to be able to get those artifacts back. It also has a very nice option to draw cards, though, so that is very useful for this deck. And then we have Urza's Cave, which is a land that tutors for other lands and puts them onto the battlefield. So it's just another helpful tutor that doesn't necessarily ramp us, and it's just nice to have a little bit more redundancy. The last area that we need to talk about is protection. I think this is the one area where this deck is lacking right now. If we're not able to protect from artifact wipes, counter spells, targeted removal for Wowzer, and other things that would disrupt our plans to get our commander out and swinging or developing our board, we're never going to pull out a win. So for now, I'm sticking with this build until I do some playtesting and know what I need to cut. But if you have any ideas for synergistic protection pieces that can get us help in this deck, I'd love to hear them. And I'd love to see a newer version of this deck that has a better protection package. For now, this is what we have. We have Angel Fire Ignition and Lightning Greaves. They're just both great protection pieces, and they are haste enablers, which helps us fulfill the requirement that Wowzer has to attack. Breakish Blunder is a bit of interaction that also lets us get a map token. And Dovin's Veto and Teferi's Protection are just great protection pieces. Teferi's lets you protect your whole board from the worst for a turn, and Dovin's lets you counter board wipes and other targeted removal and such. All right, now let's get into the meat of the video. How are we going to achieve each one of those 14 requirements? Let's start with the mana cost. This feels like it's the easiest requirement to fulfill. We just need Colorless, Wooberg, and Snow Mana to get enough mana to cast our commander. 
Colorless is going to come with a lot of our utility land, so we don't need to stretch to get that. The same goes for Wooburg. We included a pretty even distribution of colored mana generation, and we have a lot of ramp pieces that are going to help us get the colors that we need. Finally, there's snow mana, which is easy enough to generate if we just include a whole bunch of snow lands. So we've included the full cycle of Kaldheim snow lands, the ones that enter tapped and tap for two colors. And we have every kind of colored basic snow mana with a couple of extra snow covered forests to help us with our ramp distribution. We also have Into the North and Explore the Underdark, which we've already mentioned. These help us with our fixing of snow mana because they can grab those basic and snow lands. Next, moving down to Wowser's text box, we need to be able to get it to attack the turn it gets out. And this is important because you know that if you are casting Wowser and you have all of this stuff on the battlefield, everyone is going to try to stop you. Someone's going to have targeted removal, especially after all of these turns of building up this board. So that's why you need more protection pieces. You also need to be really smart about when you cast it, but most importantly, you need to be able to win the turn that Wowzer comes out. We've already talked about Angel Fire Ignition and Lightning Greaves. Let's talk about some others. Arbalest Engineers are going to give something Trample and Haste when they enter, but most likely you're going to use it to get a Power Stone, so this is just if you are in a pinch and don't have anything else. Bloody Betrayal and Sibling Rivalry can both target Wowser and give him haste, and they give you a token in case you were still missing that when he comes down. And that's something that you'll see with some of these is that they fulfill the requirement the moment that Wowser gets onto the battlefield, which does meet our condition. Conduit Goblin gives you two energy, so that's one of our requirements, and it triggers at the beginning of combat, lets you spend one energy to give something haste. That's about as efficient as it gets, and it's another way to get energy. Handware Battlements is our one land in the deck that gives haste, so it's great tutor target if you don't already have something that gives haste, and it's one of the cheapest ways to give haste to something. And finally, we have Stirring Bard. It gives the initiative and lets you tap to give something haste. Once again, another great haste enabler, but it does take a turn to be able to activate. All right, now let's go down the list of the things that Wowzer needs when it attacks in order to win. First, we have to have one energy. We've already talked about Conduit Goblin and Royal Cartographer. So what are some other ideas? And you'll notice that in all but one of these categories, we have lands that fulfill the requirement for us. So let's talk about those ones first. Aether Hub and Helios One are both great ways to get energy. And if we end up using other ways to get energy, they also have other helpful effects that help us with mana fixing and controlling the game. Remember that it's important to hold on to your energy unless you have another way to generate it or you have an excess. Aetherworks Marvel gives us energy when something goes to the graveyard, which is super easy to do with all these artifact tokens that sacrifice themselves. It's also great card advantage, lets us dig a little bit deeper if we have extra energy. In a similar vein, Gaunti's Aether Heart triggers for all of our artifact tokens, and so this is going to be really easy to get a whole bunch of energy. Plus, we could potentially get an extra turn from this, which will help us get Wowzer onto the battlefield in a board state that we can control. And finally, we have Decoction Module. It's just a little bit of a utility with returning creatures to hand in case we need extra triggers, but it also gives us an avenue, so if we can just cast Wowzer, we'll get an energy and that will be enough to win the game. Next, we need a Blood Token. Bloody Betrayal is a haste enabler we've already talked about, gives us a Blood Token pretty easily. Old Rutstein helps us with our self mill plan and it can generate us blood and treasures depending on what we mill. This is very helpful to keep on the battlefield for a long time, and kind of the inspiration behind the self-mill category of this deck. Transmutation Font gives us access to blood, clues, and food, and it gives us a nice artifact tutor if we are hurting for one of the other requirements. Voldaren Estate is our one land that generates blood tokens. Five mana is a steep cost, but the benefit of being able to tutor it with the rest of our lands is worthwhile. But if we have artifact tutors, Transmutation Font is probably the way we want to go. Next, we need a clue token. With the release of Karlov Manor, we have a whole cycle of lands that came out in the clue expansion that let us investigate for four and tapping it. 
We've included the lot of them here, mostly because we need it to help with our fixing, but also because it means that getting clues is one of the easiest requirements to fulfill. Clues are also great for card advantage, so we get some extra clue generation. That'll help us get our other requirements filled quickly. We've also mentioned Transmutation Font as a potential way to get a clue. In addition, we have Academy Manufacturer, which gives us food, treasure, and clues all at the same time. Fey Offering, which largely does the same. And the Third Doctor, which gives us one of those three once. Next, we have Food, which you've already seen four cards, we just talked about them, that all generate food. We have a few other helpful cards here, though. Nuka-Cola Vending Machine is fantastic at generating food and subsequently getting treasures whenever we sacrifice those foods. This is not the only great way to get two of our requirements filled. It's a great mana sink to store away some extra treasures to help accelerate our endgame. Restless Cottage and The Shire are our lands that generate food tokens. I would tend to lean more toward the Shire because activating Restless Cottage and making an attack is a bit riskier, whereas the Shire is much easier to activate and get a payoff from. Next we have Tireless Provisioner, which gets us either treasures or food whenever lands enter the battlefield, which again is a great way to knock out two birds with one stone. Now clues, treasures, and food are easy enough because they have so much support. Let's talk about the two hardest tokens to produce maps and power stones. Maps are difficult to produce because most map token generators, which so far mostly just come from Lost Caverns of Ixalan, are enter the battlefield effect on creatures. We want something more consistent and reliable, so we've chosen these carefully. We've mentioned Breakish Blunder as a interaction piece already, and it seems to be one of the only ways that we can make a map token while also interacting with one of our opponents. Cartographer's Companion is an artifact that makes a map token. It's important to have that little bit of redundancy in case our other things don't go well, but mostly it's just in here because it's an artifact. Restless Anchorage is the one land in the game that makes map tokens, and it's another one of the man lands that you have to pay mana into and then let attack. So it's hard to get the map this way, but it's easiest to tutor for, so this is what we have to work with. My favorite map generator is Worldwalker Helm. It's the one map generator that isn't in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, and it's great. It not only lets us make map tokens whenever other artifact tokens are made, but it's going to give us a way to make copies of those tokens, which helps us with other synergies like treasures and food, something that we want to stockpile. So far, this is the easiest way to make maps, and it's absolutely essential for the deck. Now let's talk about the other hard one to make, which is Power Stones. Arbalest Engineers and Sibling Rivalry, we've already mentioned. Hall of Taxin is our land that makes Power Stones, and again, it's a steep cost to make them. But once again, if we don't have another way to make them, lands are the easiest thing to tutor for. It's also a great pick if you want to pick something early on that will help us with ramp, because Power Stones will help us activate other abilities on our lands. I'm also going to include Karn Living Legacy here, which is the first and maybe only time I'm putting him into a deck. It's really easy for him to make power stones, but also the second ability can help us dig in a pinch. Again, not ideal, but it's one of the best options for this specific purpose. Sarenth Great Worm is a great landfall effect, which we already know we liked. It gets us a lot of power stones. So this is going to be a great way for us to ramp and get us the mana that we need to activate our lands. And then finally, the Mana Rig is probably my favorite of the bunch for power stone generation. It triggers whenever you cast a multicolor spell, which is going to work great with Wowzer and other legendary creatures that we put in the deck. It's also a great digging ability that gives us a bit more card advantage. Next down the list, and our final artifact token type, is Treasure. This is easily one of the most supported artifact themes in the game, so it's no surprise that this is going to be easy for us to fill in cards here. It also helps us with our ramp and mana fixing, so it's just a great strategy to invest a lot into. We've already discussed Academy Manufacturer, Fey Offering, Nuka-Cola Vending Machine, Old Rutstein, The Third Doctor, and Tireless Provisioner. We have a few others of importance, but I'm actually going to save two of them for a later section since they have the ability to give us the initiative, and I want to talk about those separately. Mines of Moria and Treasure Vault are the lands that we have that are specifically geared toward treasures. 
Both are going to be easy to activate, and they're going to get us at least one treasure, which is all we need. And then Prosperous Partnership is the only other include I have here. And I put it in here because it's just so efficient. It gives us a couple of extra bodies, it gives us some chump blockers, and it's going to give us another great way to generate a bunch of treasures and a bunch of mana ramp. All right, we're down to the last three requirements for Wowzer's ability. These last three aren't artifact tokens, but more of states of being. The first one is the Monarch, which we can get easy enough by playing certain cards, but then we may struggle to keep it if people are attacking us because of the card advantage it supplies. So it's always a good idea to try to hold off on getting the Monarch until we are close to casting Wowzer. Court of Ardendale and Court of Bounty are already good ways to get the Monarch. We have a couple of other good effects. Regal Behemoth is a great ramp piece that doubles the effectiveness of our lands. It costs a lot, but if it stays out of turn and we keep the Monarch, that's a lot of fuel for filling out our other requirements. Dawnglade Region is a good way to protect our stuff, gives our stuff hexproof if we have the Monarch. And Throne of the High City is our land that gives us the Monarch. Again, it's not a cheap ability, but this is actually probably one of the easiest ways to hold off on the activation until we're closer to getting Wowzer out. Our next state of being is the City's Blessing, which we can get from the Ascend ability. We're going to have no trouble getting to 10 permanents, and we really just have to have any one of these on the battlefield to get the Blessing, and we don't have to protect the City's Blessing for the rest of the game. So really, out of every requirement, this is one of the easiest. Araska Relic and Wayward Swordtooth, we've already mentioned. The other items are Ark of Araska and Teamer Elevator. Both lands. The latter one is a test card. I thought it was fitting to put that in with the Wowzer deck, and I honestly just really like the design of this land. Please make more. Last and probably least is the initiative, unfortunately. The initiative is by far the hardest to get and keep. Like the Monarch, it goes to someone else if they deal combat damage to us. Unlike the Monarch, we've only seen the initiative in a single set, which was the Battle for Baldur's Gate set. On top of that, almost every creature that cares about the initiative only gives it on entering the battlefield, and there are no lands that give us the initiative. This is the one requirement that we cannot fill with lands. If it weren't for the initiative, this challenge would be so much simpler, but we have to consider how we're going to get it and keep the initiative in every game. And so a lot of effort in this deck is going specifically towards the initiative. We've already mentioned Stirring Bard and Explore the Underdark, which both give us the initiative and do something else. Our two remaining cards are Dungeoneer's Pack and Loot Dispute, both of which make a treasure token as well. Loot Dispute is fine, and it does the job, but Dungeoneer's Pack is probably the best card in the deck for getting the initiative. Let's put it this way, if we don't get Dungeoneer's Pack, our chance of winning the game with Wowzer is pretty slim. This is the reason why we have all the artifact tutoring in our deck. This is the reason why we have trading post to get the Dungeoneer's pack out of the graveyard if we self-mill it. And this is just the easiest card to find, and it's imperative that we do so, otherwise we're mostly shooting blind. It is also, annoyingly, something that enters the battlefield tapped, which means it takes more than one turn to activate and we can't do it on the turn that Wowzer comes out. We just don't have the support to be able to untap it. That can't be helped, and we just have to hope for some way to protect ourselves for a turn cycle, or to draw one of the other effects. Well, I hate to end on a downer, but that was a very aspirational and meaty deck tech. This is not going to be a very strong deck, but I hope that I've made it at least consistent to get the many requirements to fulfill. I'd recommend taking this deck and making it your own by upgrading the protection and the interaction while fine tuning it to make sure you still have enough pieces to make your game plan work consistently. Wowzer was a ton of fun to think about and build and I'm super excited to have made this tech and share it with you all. What do you think? Would you have built it another way? Let me know in the comments and I will see you in the next one. Thank you for watching.